So guess what? Guess what time it is? It's very tiny. Can't tell. Is it show until time? A, well, it's time for replacement. Oh, is that a is that a Lammy refill? It is. So I was careful. You know, don't don't squirt that me. stuff in your eye. It's a good thing you're wearing eye protection. It'll. So the question is. And this is an important question, actually. So I've put my, there we go. Now was that, I've. Was that blue? It's blue black. Oh, yes. There's my. No. My nude, there's. My nude, Nobody. there's. This is just black. Okay. So there's an important question. I know when I am putting the, the pen back together. Mm hmm. I have to make sure that when I'm holding it, mm -hmm. the Lammy, the word Lammy, is pointed <laughs> up and is in a line, is aligned with. I the feel like you're going to be in, uh, you're going to get a disappointing response to your very important question. <laughs> so, my very important question is, is how do you do it? But I. <laughs> can already feel the response, sir, will be, well, I don't care. Yeah, exactly. So, so <laughs> yes. Uh, and, but, but, okay, so why does it matter the the orientation of where it says Lammy when you're holding the pen? Because I don't, I just, maybe and, I just don't have oh, the brand loyalty. Maybe I, I'm wondering where it, this it's is It's not even, it's, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a, it, it probably is just a weird little Cormac OCD thing. This because, sounds exactly so, like OCD. So yeah. when I'm holding it, uh -huh. you know, holding it like so. When you're holding it very the, oddly with your left hand. Jeez. Oh, yeah, that's right. I mean, I could use, <laughs> I could point to you in a specific manner. Yeah, I'm sure but then you when could. I, and, But then when I put the cap on, uh -huh. cap. I do. You know, I like to do that. I like <laughs> Okay. Okay. I'm not fully crazy. I just wanted to make sure I'm not. I like a, fully I like insane. to align things. Oh, so uh, where where is where's my? There it is. Okay. <laughs> See, so, I knew I was going to drag you into my yeah, insanity. So so I have the an Acme Frank Lloyd Wright fountain pen that my dad gave me here, and mm. I don't I I did not set this up. This this was not a setup. But I don't know if you can tell, but it, the the cap clip is mm -hmm. perfectly aligned with the graphics of the bottom of the pen. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> yeah, so that is that is important to me, but only when I close the pen. So so when you and and you will you'll be duly disappointed right now because I don't know where my Lammy is. <laughs> it's gone. You say Lammy. It's yeah, weird yeah, that you singular. say Lammy singular. Singular. <laughs> I'm not I don't like even you. understand that. <laughs> I've always eyeballed the 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 different outer surface of the Lammies, and and in want, I, I I would like several different colors. I would like the yellow one. Um, so my, I would like the white one. Pen. I have a matte black one somewhere if I still have it. My, and I and uh, but I I always say no, Cormac. I always have the self restraint to say no. I don't need another one. I just I have one. That's not self-restraint. That's what if you set it down and somebody who says, you know, I've always wanted a yellow one, picks up my yellow one and walks away with it. That, that I'm not saying you would be that yet, that person. I, clearly, because I don't have a yellow one. <laughs> but uh, speaking of which, where is my yellow one? <laughs> you just need to yell. Man yells at cloud. Where's my pen? Evan, can you tell me where my yellow Lammy pen is? Now, now you've got like, me really wanting to right find, find my black Lammy somewhere. <laughs> uh, it's the addiction. It is the addiction. You know, I go through yeah. spurts of writing things down. Okay, so for example, if I were to open up this pen here on camera, you'll also notice something about the refillable cartridge. I don't have the refill cartridges like you. Mm -hmm. Can you tell? Can you see what's going on yes. there? It's empty. Uh -huh. um, well, I did so see that you have your noodler's ink. I could ready refill to it on. That would be make for a great podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Heaven refills ink. I go through these these 
phases of writing stuff down and then not writing stuff down for a very long time. I, I get the feeling you're you're different. You're probably always using it. And I know you like your field notes and your reporter's notebooks and all these things. And and I have a few, you know, field notesy kind of books here. And I even have some larger scale. So so here's here's the two different scales of notebooks that I'm I'm using right now. One's about a a half of an eight and a half by eleven, and one's about a what would you call that? I don't know. A quarter. That is the three by five. And I haven't been using them for months now. I just haven't. I just, I go between I, like putting everything in the computer so that I can search it, right? That's a very important thing to me. Or writing stuff down. And I don't know why I do this. I don't know why I switch back and forth because I, I get value out of both of them for, for various reasons. Different value. Right. I like just writing stuff down. Right? I like using my hands to do things. And at the same time, like it, it's, I don't know. I am, I, you're OCD to like where, where your, the alignment of the, the label and, and the, the clip on the pen are. And I'm, yeah, I'm the opposite of OCD when it comes to like how I take notes and where I put them. They're in 18 different apps and notebooks. And I just, I, I don't have a system for that. It's just kind of whatever I think of in the moment. That's where they go, and it's 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 terrible. I actually can't find anything. So, well, I don't know. I I'm, I'm a writer, not a not a typer. not a uh, typer. Yeah. <laughs> I have one other show and tell. Okay. I'm gonna do show and tell. <laughs> I, I'm gonna so look I around. Was, I, I, don't, I don't think I have anything to show. So I was suggested a book because. Tom Main was just at the local architecture school he, giving a lecture and he was talking about a book that Who's Tom Main? Um, <laughs> just just I'm giving you an opportunity to give some more context slow. here just just like the last podcast where I asked you like what is yeah. whatever you're talking about <laughs> what's we a punch list about, we were talking about punch list <laughs> and oh my god this entire week has been all about talking about and griping about punch list that oh, because of the podcast done. or because no, of real no, reasons it, just real reasons oh, I mean man. we're working on it's the Hopkins project it's phased while occupied and we're doing some oh, yeah, yeah. we're doing a partial substantial completion and so we're doing a punch list and when the architect's punch list is hundreds of hundreds of items long it should not be the architect's responsibility to be making that punch list that is an architect that is a contractor's deficiency list i don't care what anyone says i i know what it says in the contract and and that's in i'm supported by the contract and we've just been, we've been griping about it all week long. And I'm not even the one out there in the field doing it. Other people are out in the field doing it. It's just, they're like, well, you know, we have to do this. I'm like, why are you doing this? But anyway, because that's don't a understand. side track. But you digress. <clears throat> but I digress. Back to so Tom Main and to whoever that is. Tom Main. So Tom Main, whoever that is. That is a guy who I will always call his firm by the name that he used, that he used when the he was giving a lecture. You the pronunciation. Say? Okay. When he was presenting, when I was in architecture school well over 20 plus years ago. Everybody knows how good your memory is, though. Well, it was morphosis, <laughs> not morphosis. <laughs> and... Even I bet this would be easy to look up. I bet he's done it both ways. We should we should find videos online and just make a, <laughs> a, a video of clips of him saying his first name would in be different a ways. Montage. <laughs> there you go. Tom Mann, right. Tom Mann. But anyway, so he was giving this lecture, and I wasn't there, wasn't able to go. A friend of our friend of the show, most of the time, affectionately referred to as Coffee Boy. Um, <laughs> he it, actually said it's in the mail to me. It, it has Did not he? shown up. So the mail, there must be something oh, wrong with the mail. <laughs> that he doesn't get a name. I was almost about to give his name. <laughs> right. nope. He gets he gets no name. Anyway, but he did give a suggestion. And it's this. Okay. 
as we can see here, hopefully everybody you can got, see You got to say this. it too for the, for the listeners. I'm going to say this for the listeners and then not just the viewers, but the listeners, it's 100 books. Oh, it isn't. From 1900 to 2000. It doesn't say 100 books. <sighs> You're right. Should I like... <laughs> Uh, 100, a book you got that clap. has the you got a golf clap for that performance that is fantastic 100 buildings it's been late yeah been talking yeah. about punch been, lists all day it's been a big week yeah 100 buildings okay. 100 buildings from 1900 to 2000 and from what I'm surprised it was you didn't say 100 years I mean, you had it was right there. It it was right in the title. I mean, it, it's right there. So maybe it should have been 100 buildings for 100 years. Yeah. We'll we'll go. go with that. From how it was explained to me in the lecture that was given is that basically there was a sent out a basically reached out to all of the star architect friends of, of Tom's and basically did a survey of like, what are your favorite buildings of the, from, of the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and then compiled based off of the ranked them based off of the frequency of the response. And so like, say if, um, yeah, I'll go with number one in the book, uh, and it's interesting how it's broken down too, but number one in the book is Villa Savoy. Uh -huh. And Makes so sense. I'm assuming that based off of the number of entries that Villa Savoy um, received is what gave it its ranking. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't see anywhere in here where it said, here's just the hundred and this is based off of the, in no particular order. But it, it was kind of interesting because then it goes to Ronchamp, then it goes to the German Pavilion, also known as the Bar Barcelona Pavilion. This is like the, um, the who's who of architectural, uh, of buildings. And, then, and it, it's and then, in the formative years that we all learned about these, right? So right. I can see how they made such an impact. Yeah. One of the things that was part of the conversation was is he's noticing more and more younger architects are not using historic precedents for research when it comes to precedent studies for buildings. Mm. And, and that was the, I believe that was the impetus for this book is to kind of illustrate that there are more than just what you find on Google. Um, and <laughs> funny enough, mm. well, and, it, it and, used and so, to be slide carousels, right? In architectural history oh class gosh. is, is where all these came from. <laughs> You know, it's so funny that you said. I mean, I slept through those classes. I, I will come clean right now. And I, we recently had a conversation about this when we were at the AIA conference. But that was yeah. the class I learned how to sleep in school in. But <laughs> I, I still fondly remember those classes. I mean, and those slide carousels. And, like, my architectural history teacher coming to class carrying slide carousels. And the lights go out and the slides oh, start. Yeah. And that sound of the slides during the monotone lecture. <laughs> like, it's all flooding back in right now and here you'll see Villa Savoy yeah yeah <laughs> pause long pause you know pause for dramatic effect <laughs> it's white plaster punctuates the grain background I don't know I don't even know who I'm you know um, yeah I wonder who who's the, uh, who's the caricature because that professor is certainly not anyone that I was I was it was, it was actually kind of interesting it's like so my architectural history professor, so I had gotten out of the army. I started going to college and I went to, started my college experience at Troy State University, which is now Troy University, a small university in Alabama. It's basically because I was sort of put on a waiting list for Auburn because they, I mean, I, I was a transfer student. And so there's a very small number of people that go to get transferred in. So I just started school, just wanted to get, I'm, I'm out of, I'm out of the army. I need to do something. So I, I went ahead and started school somewhere else. <laughs> I and need more, no, more physical, mental punishment. I'm going to go to architecture school. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I was, I was, I was starting. So I, I did all of the basics, and that's also where I was majoring in archaeology oh, that's and right. anthropology. So uh, Not architect. that was you hadn't, a, you hadn't gone full punishment level yet. Okay. I actually, what it seems like is that I hadn't been able to flip past the ARs in the you career get, catalog. You didn't get very far. Army, architecture, right? Archaeologist. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> Reverse those last two. But still, I stayed in the ARs. Apparently, yeah. there's more. I, from what I understand, there are more careers out there. I just haven't figured them out, and I haven't pursued any of them. Yeah, there's still time. You're right. Who there's knows? still time. Yeah, you can get to the um, A. You can get to astronomy and astrology. You could become an astrologist, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but yeah, so I, I started there, ultimately transferring in. But... It, it was just and the history professor, because I was also me just wanting to kind of explore everything and also take some of the one on one classes too. But my, my professor of history at Troy state, then when I transferred to Auburn to start taking architecture classes, I walked into my first architectural history course and guess who was the professor there? The same guy that was the, that was, he had transferred from Troy State to Auburn to become the architectural history professor Okay, at Auburn. Was that a good and thing? I was just like, eh, I mean, <laughs> the, the one good thing was, is at least I knew him. And I, it was funny is because everybody's like, oh my gosh, Professor Kenworthy is so tough. And I was like, he's not tough once you get to know him. And they're like, well, you just had, you know, a year and a half of, of his courses uh, at your other school. So, of course, you know, I'm like, no, oh, you know, there you go. There's my leg up. There you go. <laughs> but, but I mean, the, the one thing that I will say, and the reason why I bring that up is that, you know, the, the, this whole notion of not really looking at precedent where studies, where we've come from, where we've been kind of the language that is developed from, 200 years ago to 100 years ago to 50 years ago to 25 years ago and there are so many stark evolutions in architecture throughout let's just say the last 200 years that to to ignore them seems silly hmm. that we we don't do that and so that was the impetus of this book is that it was hey let's not forget that there is at least in this one, and we've talked about it on after my road trip is like, what makes build a building lovable mm -hmm. and looking at the list of all of the people who contributed to this book. And then what's interesting about it, and you can't really tell, and, and for the listeners, what's interesting about this is it's a, a black and yellow cover. It's a black, a yellow letters and with a black background. And there's these dots that start from the back of the the book to the front of the book and what those dots represent is the voting from mm. and there's a list of all of the people who were on the on this kind of like jury and then so there's all of these people and then based off of like the ranking there's a dot next to them of if they voted for that particular building or not mm. or had submitted that particular building mm -hmm. and what was really interesting about it is just it kind of like diminishes as it gets further into like the 100, like sure. 98 through 100 and stuff. But it, it is definitely, I would say that it is a hundred percent filled with North American and European avant-garde architecture. Hmm. It is, there is nothing about kind of like the history or tradition, which is, which is interesting because my own personal opinion is that where are, where there are things here that are cutting edge, they sort of ignored that some of the buildings that came before them that were kind of the, like, were the grandfathers of say like high rise, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's nothing in here about Louis Sullivan and being the grandfather of the modern skyscraper. It's not a but history yeah, book. Yeah. But there's a, a lot of modern skyscrapers. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not necessarily that, but if you think about it, like what is, w there's modern office buildings in here, right? Mm -hmm. So what, you know, what was the 
precursor to the modern office building let's say the Wainwright building and which by the way <laughs> did I tell you this the Wainwright building is actually is currently being auctioned off by the state of Missouri yeah you did yeah, yeah, we, yeah I think yeah. yes that we was did super cool and it was it fifty thousand dollars or something last time we looked right? well there was uh no it was fifty million dollars or fifty million sorry. no 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 five million Five. was the was the current bid and it you could increase by fifty thousand dollar increment fifty thousand dollars yeah yeah so we're gonna have to i'm gonna have to of course hunt this down and, and see hey, you gotta, yeah the, you gotta pull it up the the current. I, I i do need to <laughs> yeah i do need to update the um, follow up with that so 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 doing. this book is compiled by just asking people what their 100 favorite buildings were i would say most loved buildings okay and so then you're basically saying everybody submitted a lot of buildings and like like did everybody submit 100 is that the idea and i like whatever the list of people that were asked all 100 buildings that are in this book were submitted by every single person on that list or no you're just saying he asked 100 people and they whittled it down to the the 100 most cited buildings on their list yes. and everything beyond the 100 I, I, just I, fl- I, fell off okay i th- i think that's it yeah i think okay. that's it real time update now we're a week later and the Wainwright state office building is still hovering at 5 million dollars hmm. and you still have till august 29th to place your bid Let's get on this, people. <laughs> and if there's anybody out there interested in providing me with a little bit of like seed money for it, six, seven well, million. What I would you I... do with the Wainwright building? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. Cause... And could you stop at just one? I mean, you have a bunch of Lammies. I don't know if you you might want need more Wainwrights as well. I would have to come up with a. Uh, Wainwright series. Actually, I think that this pen is that's pretty much matches Wainwright the color. color right there. Yeah. It matches the color of it. So, yeah. I think that I would start. I would see if Lammy would come up with a uh, special edition Wainwright. So then it would have kind of like maybe the some of the intricate details that the Wainwright building has on there. That would be cool. Uh, oh, <laughs> Do a, see a mashup. So, so I have questions about this book, this one hundred buildings book. Yes. So, of course, Tom Main, like, put a book together, right? Because... Yes, yes, he did. Because this is basically in response to people looking up um, precedents on Google, right? So, so Or not, just not using precedents at all, or not is using another one of right? his so, um, so it's a book, which nobody reads books anymore, right? Um, nobody reads books anymore, in air quotes. You, Cormac holds it up. He, <laughs> Cormac also writes with a pen on paper, turns out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I use a mimeograph machine. <laughs> I make copies with my mimeo. So, so, okay, it's a book. It's an odd format. Like the what would you say the dimensions of this book are? It's like four by twelve or something. Four by ten. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, and and how it thick? Is. It's about an inch and a half thick. It looks like about a two by four thick. Yeah. It's about an inch thick. Okay, so. It's a really interesting, weird format, of course, right? Because it's Tom it is. again, right? So it, it can't be, there's there's just nothing standard about this. And so what's it like, to, because it's not, it's not like a lay flat binding, is it? So it's, it's, it's like all it's the, not. all the pages are glued to the, to the binding, right? So uh, is it? No, it, it, I mean, in theory, it's supposed to be a lay flat. Okay. Okay. If, uh, Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. I was just wondering, like, what, because th- skinny books like that are, they're, they're just not good to hold open, but it looks like that, that, that they got over that with the binding. Yeah. Yeah. So give me a number. Let's see. Uh, what. 83. 83. Sure. Okay. The wrong direction there. 83. Okay. The Van Nel Factory in Rotterdam, Netherlands. And if I was sitting in, oh, Johannes Brinkman. Does not ring a bell. 
it has a very Bauhausian feel to it. Bauhausian. All right. All right. So Nin- let's flip the 19, number. Let, go ahead. What's 1926 to 1930. Okay. This is <laughs> this was architectural <laughs> history class, right? It's the name of the building, the location, the years, <laughs> the architect. <laughs> this is what we had to memorize. <laughs> mm. Okay, so if we flip the number and go thirty-eight, so let's go er- much earlier in the. So thirty-eight. Let, let's earlier. yeah. Let's see earlier, and and maybe maybe we've got something. It's not it. earlier in history. No, no, I just mean earlier in the book. But yeah. it is the assembly. Um, I've never been able to pronounce this. Uh, Chandara? I picked that one on purpose. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Just to show what a fool you are. <laughs> Le, Cor- Le Corbusier, 1951 through 1964. All right. All right. Yep. Yep. That's the one with the uh, kind of hood scoop um, roof. Yeah. All concrete. Of um, course. Pretty. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to hold it up for a picture and maybe we'll drop it in there. And, copyright infringement. You yeah. know, copyright infringement and all of that other stuff. But this is for educational purposes. We're fine. We're it is really kind of interesting when you, you see all of these mid century modern buildings that have these kind of reflecting pools mm-hmm. um, that kind of surround them. And I don't know how many you've been to. So, uh, or even modern yeah. buildings. There's several modern or even ones. Modern. The, the glass jewel case sitting in the middle of the exactly. serene pond. And, and usually, it, with this one is no exception, that is more or less a roof structure over mm-hmm. some other occupied space below it. And I don't know. The, the few that I've seen were mid-century, so I'd probably say that they were maybe late 50s, early 60s. And I'm thinking of a specific one on um, St. John's campus in Annapolis, Maryland by Richard Neutra. And then another one um, on Wayne State campus by, I just blanked. I just had it in my head. Anyway, so there's these, but they, but every one of them are empty. And you know why they're empty? Because they leak in. Building problems they leaking yeah. <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> There's a, a a much newer example uh, in Southern California where I used to live at one of the colleges, and it's a Vignoli building, and it has the glass cube in the middle of the reflecting pond. And the reflecting pond is you know two inches deep or something. It's not. Yeah, it's not yeah. like it. But but it's got a black bottom. You can't tell where the bottom of it is, and it is. Right. It's really beautiful, especially when at night you know or in the in the at dusk when the 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 jewel cases lit up from within and it's just yeah, this yeah. lantern and you know perfect you know uh, mirror reflection and all this stuff i can't tell you how many times i've seen that pond empty and I, I keep calling it a pond and when i think of, it's not really the right word the reflecting pool was empty yeah. with all the 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 raised pavers mm-hmm. from around it taken out and they're trying to solve drainage problems because there's occupied space underneath this thing. (laughs) I don't know why they do that. I don't know why that that (laughs) seems to be. It's just like, oh, I need, we need more space. So let's just build it under. Ooh, got an idea. (laughs) Let's make the roof a swimming pool. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's for for the opulence. And that's why we do it. So I'm wondering where I was going with that is I'm wondering how many times that's been emptied for that very reason, which, I mean, we talked about this in the last shows. You got to applaud all of these adventurous architects that try to do something that was probably well before technology caught up to it. Yeah. I mean, right. you know, now we've got green roofs that have all of these different um, systems that are part of the the overall things to create kind of like a bathtub with a leak detection system and all of these other things that that go as part of it. And and so that it is expected that if by some some chance there is a leak, you're going to catch it quick. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know that none of that technology happened existed back then of course probably what they did was that the black of the reflecting pool was probably tar like straight out tar <laughs> right like, toxic <laughs> what is that what's that smell <laughs> <laughs> yeah but 
But yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because it, this this kind of plea for architects and architectural designers to look at the past and look at some of this is, is kind of interesting because especially coming from an architect who is an avant-garde architect in his own right and standing at the base of the the federal building in San Francisco. I can't put my finger on what buildings from the past would have been kind of like the precedents precedent well, study. Yeah, but it, and I don't think you could trace that kind of thing directly. I mean, you can sometimes, I guess, but with Tom sure, sure. in particular, I don't think you could trace that, but it doesn't diminish the fact that he knows that stuff. And right? I didn't and, mean and I didn't mean that there, there was there had to have been yeah, or there's no, you know, no direct that was a, lineage, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, right. his own buildings are the lineage of, of these projects. It's a it's the the evolution of of morphosis, if, if you want to say it the right way. Um, but but the idea of of putting this book together, how is it? What, do you agree with his thesis? Um, and do you do. think that the output or this this resource is valuable? And is it something that our listeners should pick up? With our maybe we'll put an Amazon affiliate link in our show notes for this one so they can help out the podcast and purchase a book that they'll never read. But it, it, is it a good table coffee? Is it a coffee table book? Is it something that you actually read? Like, like give me an idea of, well, of how you've started to consume this. So two different, two different ways I've been consuming it. One, just flipping through quickly just to see what buildings are actually what made the top 100 list. Mm-hmm. And since I've been working on some writing of my own on doing kind of a narration of my, uh, my road trip that I took, I, I was looking to see how other people kind of give these, these brief kind of narratives of a building. These are, these are buildings who's shaped, who are those loved buildings, who are those what set the stage for the star architects and what set the stage for all of these different design trends and everything else. And, and I'm just curious how they write about them because is that what it is know, like a collection of blurbs from, from the different contributors that, yeah, that just show up yeah. within the project page. Yeah. Because, and, and again, if, if somebody, um, is looking at this on YouTube, read you know, basically it's a couple of graphics, and sometimes a couple of photos, sometimes just one photo with a little bit of a floor plan. And, and it's, and then basically just a small, like single paragraph that actually, funny enough, if I'm, I'm flipping through all of these, is roughly around the same number of words for each of the paragraphs because they all look like they're formatted in the same little small mm -hmm. cell. Mm -hmm. And just, just a quick blurb of, what the building is and it really just talks about it in that um very kind of like i am intending to put evan to sleep with my slideshow type format i didn't i didn't sleep at all i swear <laughs> <laughs> stockholm public library though do you know who that is you you've seen that right I'm trying to think it? if I went there. I don't think I did. I don't think. Did I you went go there. to Stockholm, Sweden? I did go to Stockholm. But... Did you see a building that was square at the first four floors, and then a round turret was coming up through the center of it? Mm, I don't think so. Well, I need to look it up. May, I guess. May I say that you missed something very special. Uh, it's so interesting because, you know, um, looking at, again, looking at some of these, you know, you got like the Pompidou Center, Johnson Wax headquarters, Farnsworth House, and I have not yet read the write-up of the Farnsworth House, but I have my own write-up of the Farnsworth House that I, that I did when I mm -hmm. looked at it. And it's both awe and disturbed i don't know not Yours really disgust there. mine <laughs> mine because it was it's it's one of those ones as i told you this it's that one of all of 
the buildings that I have visited to date in my lifetime is one that baffles me. Here is a $42,000 house that, unlike, say, a Wright building or some other architects, is not, it's on the landscape, not of the landscape, right? Mm. So sometimes it could, it, to preserve something, it might be okay to move it. And the reason I say that is because it's on the banks of the Wisconsin River and I believe it's called the Wisconsin River. Uh, anyway, it's on the banks of a river and it has been flooded countless yeah. times. The windows That's just are part broken of it, out. Though. That's just part of it. But so for it's an, an expensive origi- proposition, <laughs> an original budget, an original budget of forty-two thousand dollars, and yes, that was not the end budget; that was the beginning budget. Right. But for something that started at forty-two thousand, for them to have sunk tens, Liter- of, tens literally. of millions of dollars, <laughs> literally sunk <laughs> on preservation and protection of, there was even a a proposal kicked around that they wanted to basically put it on an elevated plat an elevating platform. Oh, that'd be that, fancy. <laughs> that Got when, it up out of the way. When it and so to. we yeah, exactly. So when you're walking and they're like, oh well it was placed here because it's just outside of the the hundred year floodplain. And then you're thinking to yourself, yeah, how's that working out for you? Um, as one. And two, it is literally on the lowest part of the site. And I'm thinking to myself, how the hell is this on the outside of the 100-year floodplain, because when you look just up the, the back there, of the there's, site... There's higher places all over around 100-year floodplains, Carl. Well, there's a lot, <laughs> like every other space <laughs> there. <laughs> and and so that one is just one of these, and, and I'd love to hear anybody's take on this, on why that one building is so loved, so revered, um, that it has, has like to save it, to preserve it, to continue to keep the, the upkeep on it and everything else is costing tens of millions of dollars. I don't, I mean, it's tens of tens of tens of millions, not quite in the hundred million yet, but I mean, you know, in, 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 so it's a single room, you know, mm-hmm. uh, house. It was is it in your book? In in this book, yeah, I'm sure yes, it is. It okay. is. So, what does it say in there about it? Well, you're you're asking me to. I'm asking you know, for story time with Cormac right now. <laughs> you're asking me to read when it's dark in here, and my <laughs> reading okay, glasses. Man. Or... <laughs> get your get your extra get your little flashlight out. Get your lantern. <laughs> you know what? You say that, but. Thank you, go. thank you, our cat, for the pen that includes a <laughs> flashlight. You got a torch. A flashlight. A torch for those across the pond. A single story geometric form that. En- you got to read into the mic. You got you got to read into the mic here. You got story time. A, we need the, the, the deep voice. A single story geometric form that exemplifies the notion of dwelling in its simplest of states. This weekend retreat materializes Mises' favorite dictate: "Less is more." Conceived as a glass pavilion in a natural setting, the concept uses the surrounding environment as its protective shield. Mm, yeah, that was well done there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, sorry, you don't want the uh, real binary. Yeah. We're not asking for the interjections here. <laughs> the open prismatic <laughs> unity is composed of three horizontal planes, podium, th- floor, and roof slab. And let me just tell you, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, really. I mean, just the the simplicity and the cleanliness, and you just see you see that concept, and it is well executed. And, and yes, we're there you go. revisiting my, but it's still one of these <laughs> things. It, and then basically, it just says the interior is divided only by two objects containing bathrooms, kitchen, utility space, fireplace, and storage. The other small bedroom unit, oh, the other, wait, really? That's weird. The other, oh, anyway. Despite the visual modernity, the Farnsworth House can be read as a reinterpretation of a classical idea, a translation of a plinth, support, and architrave. Mm. 
Okay. Minimized. That's the write up. So I have a feeling that book is full of delicious Arca speak. <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> it is probably just <laughs> dripping full of it. Right. Um, <laughs> So, but, okay, so that's the write-up. And so that's the write-up that just basically does a quick synopsis of what it is, not why it is. Oh, here, here you no. go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to propose a, uh, an idea here, is that obviously who the author of the book and the contributors to the content of the book mm -hmm. are very much going to be, I can't ever remember if it's the left brain or right brain, but they're the designers, they're, they're right, and and here you are coming coming at this from a, a functional um, aspect of the project manager side of your brain because you're both you're totally both um, yeah and and you're you do like to achieve that balance and I would say that the people who are authoring this content are don't don't I mean of course I think every piece of architecture balances that pretty successfully to some extent but but to right. lesser of an extent on the on the functionality side from a, maybe a performance and a maintenance, especially how, when was that built? When was that project done? See, maybe Obviously maybe within the last to, hundred years, but. Well, clearly in the last hundred years. So it was number six on the, the hit parade, 1945. 1945. Okay. So, I mean, we're, we're at 80 years, just basically. Just on a tour with it. <laughs> yeah. We're at like 80 years. Um, yeah. Most architecture today doesn't even last that long, right? Well, it, most architecture today doesn't get tens of millions of dollars pumped into it all the time either. To, my house to, is older than that. To sustain it. <laughs> okay, there you go. Mine's in 1941. Yeah. And it, look, what I'm really, seriously, the, the thing that I'm really, and it, it's not a struggle, it's just like, it's it's just a desire to understand because like we have this kind of artistic like affinity for things and especially yeah. as architects we we do have the left brain and right brain and so there's the the this kind of artistic side that's like like looking at it and they're seeing the beauty of it and depending on who it is and and what their own sensibilities are it strikes them as like, Ooh, I love this. This is amazing. And everybody's is typically different or there is a similarities, obviously with this hundred, uh, I, I don't think it's a hundred architects, but let's just say maybe it's around 40. It looks like the okay. list is yeah. that are doing this. And so there are some similarities to their sensibilities and, and you go up to this and of course you look at it and you say, this is amazing. You know, you see this kind of like very, simple delicate delicate um building that exudes the concept you know exactly what he was going for and it was achieved beautifully pristinely mm -hmm. what's also interesting about it is that he actually wanted like exposed bolts and the connections and all of that other stuff and it was it was actually edith farnsworth who pushed for something far more finished because she snuck into the house that he wouldn't let her see, even though it was her house and, and slept over the weekend and said, yeah, there, you got to do something about this. There's <laughs> what a, way what a weird know. relationship they had, oh, right? <laughs> my gosh. Yeah. Well, you know that, well, <laughs> she sued him and then he ended up suing her, um, yeah. over, over this house. And so it was, it was a very interesting relationship. Um, Do you know for sure that he is the one responsible for the sighting of it, sighting of the building? Uh, possibly. I don't, I, I mean, they, they talked about it as a mutual, a mutual relationship early on. And so yeah. I would say that they probably both um, had some say in it. Yeah. You would think that somebody who is building, who typically builds in steel, steel that thing that water loves to corrode would probably have voiced a little bit more of opinion of say hey i got an idea it wouldn't have been any better if it was made out of concrete or wood just no, no. saying i'm not even saying i'm not saying build it out of a different material i'm saying 
maybe not put it on the banks of a river that yeah. you know could potentially and has proven to basically flood every friggin' year. Well, the funny thing is, the reason I bring this up, because we don't know the answer, right? Um, and, and the architect's getting the blame here. And there was a, a great oh, tweet by God. Marilyn Modinger on Twitter in the last week. I retweeted it because yeah. I thought it was so good. It's like everybody, it always comes down to blaming the architect. And it's like, there was this picture of a multifamily building, right? And we all know what those look like nowadays. And it was a very bad version of that. Stacked right? boxes. Yes. <laughs> with, with, with multiple slightly varied planes of different materials on the facade, right? Yes. And mm, with those. a lot of punched mm. windows and it was, it was absolutely terrible. Yes. And the, the thread that she was putting out there was like, stop blaming the architect. You have no idea why it turned out like this. It, right? You know, you, have, you and I have had this conversation. We've all had projects about... that have gotten VE'd to death. Sure. We've all had projects that the client asked for something demanded something mm -hmm. totally against your every fiber <laughs> right so i mean and yet it's like you who else are you gonna you're, you're not gonna blame the owner <clears throat> you're not and and you're not gonna blame the contractor because because it's the architect's vision that gets built or i don't i don't even know if this All is right. true or not but it's like somebody's got to take the blame during these analyses and it's going to be the architect even though the architect probably you know, got the least money possible out of that whole scenario, right? As far as like I'm, value I'm, for their service. I'm honestly glad that you're bringing this up because architects usually like are hard on architects. And the funny thing is, as we've said in the past, most of the time we know all of the constraints that we deal with on a daily basis. So we know <laughs> that those architects were dealing with the exact same thing. Yeah, it happens. And yet, for some reason, we as architects blame other architects. Now, I can right. give you one example for absolute fact, and you know this, and everybody else in the world knows this, of an architect who had the sole responsibility of siting a building because it was not where the, the owner wanted that building. And yet it was put exactly where the architect wanted it. And Only water. Tens, tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars later to repair, restore, and and support this thing. Falling and loved, water. loved by the two people on this show. <laughs> loved. I love it. I absolutely, there is, like, yes. But it is definitely one where you're just like, okay, so. if Another we were interesting good, relationship between the architect oh and the gosh, owner. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, you remember in the conversation that we had with Angelo when we were talking about it and he was, he always gets kind of uh, ticked off about, um, the way that that story is always told about him basically just like popping out an idea. Well, I was just recently watching a documentary on Frank Lloyd Wright. It was kind of the, one of those little two-parter American history kind of not, not quite a Ken's, Ken Burns, but still on a PBS uh, PBS. Anyway, they talked about that and they actually told the same story. However, what was interesting about it is, is that a lot of the still living interns or apprentices that worked for him and worked during this particular period and that particular building, they all substantiate that story that mm -hmm. he did basically pull it out of his hindquarters. <laughs> Subconscious, subconscious. Sub is he, he definitely pulled it out, pulled it out of his subconscious because he <laughs> he'd been mulling and thinking about it and thinking oh, yeah. about it and mulling it and all of this other stuff, and he did not. What is it? according to the documentary and according to the apprentices, there wasn't a backroom studio that he was feverishly doing all of this work on. He <laughs> literally not. he literally did everything within the three and some odd hours that it took to get from wherever they landed to the the studio to Taliesin it he he just pulled so much stuff out and like i he was a gifted draftsman he was a gifted artist oh, he was a gifted sure. renderer yeah. i mean he's he studied under honestly one of the best in louis sullivan and he was just feverish in even 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 the documentary, yes, I was totally nerding out. And I said, ooh, 
let me go back. I just finished watching right now. Let me go back and watch something of the guy who taught, taught him. Mentor and, him, yeah. and so I went and watched the, the documentary on Louis Sullivan and, and what was amazing about it is, is that even they, when they talked about Wright as a, as an apprentice to Sullivan was just an amazing draftsman and an amazing, uh, amazing artist and stuff. So, I mean, you, you can't really take a lot out of, away from this guy. I mean, sure. He had an ego bigger than, uh, the Guggenheim, but still. What were those quotes you just shared with me that were, were those from that? Or was, was uh, that was... actually, yes. The, that I did send you off a, um, where, where is it? I don't know. Where's my book? Where's my book? I wrote it down. I wrote it down because I can't remember things. Write it down with your Lammy and your notebook. I did. Lammy. Notebook. There it is. Um, remember the seed grain. Seed germ, sorry. I can't even read my own handwriting. Remember the seed germ. And essentially it is, <laughs> what is interesting about it is in a way that is his version of the idea to execution. Remember that everything comes from that seed germ. That's the whole idea of a, a party diagram, right? It's yeah. like, yeah. what is the language of this project? What What is the... What is the guiding principle that that you need to be able to see the thread throughout the entire execution of the project? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. There was some. There was another funny one though. There was another egotistical, pompous. Uh, oh, that one. That was actually. I'd, I'd have to look it up because that, I I was texting you as I I kept pausing it and rewinding it every time I heard it just so that I could like get it down properly. I'm and looking right now. Here, here you go. It was, it was the job of the architect to create a vision of nature that is more natural than nature itself. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, that was a Frank Lloyd Wright. That's great. <laughs> he also, believed, now so this one right here was amazing. Yeah. Well, what was even the other one was as long as we have the luxuries, the necessities will take care of themselves. There you go. That's the perspective. I mean, that is living. That is L I V I N. <laughs> and if anybody um, can tell me the quote, uh, the movie that I just quoted by, I can't, that's a good reference. Is that what you're saying? It is a reference. All right. And I'm not going to say it. I want people comment, to say it. Everybody, I want everybody to comment. Well, uh, yeah. Okay. So we've learned you like Lammies. Uh, this is no, a good we book. Learned, we learned that I have a, a very particular way of refilling my Lammies. I mean, we're architects. We, we align things. That's what we do. We align um, things, yes. That's a good yeah. book, 100 Buildings. We'll put a link to it that everybody can buy from our yes. Amazon affiliate link, which won't cost anybody anything, but they'll earn Arcaspeak a couple bucks, maybe, if we're lucky. Sure. And, um, and I Cormac will... is still on the fence about the Farnsworth house. And I'm not on the fence. Okay. So I'm definitely not on the fence. I am still... Tr it is... There is... It, it is... Standing there, it has answered everything that I asked of it, which was, why are you lovable? <laughs> However, I can't wait to read this. I am this really, right really, trip. yeah, I'm really interested in, in, and it really just kind of like, it was the sea germ for me of thinking about why we preserve buildings and spend so much money for that. What is that emotional connection, that, that love affair of that particular piece that we're saving? I mean, good example is, is that we're go we've downtown Detroit, the Michigan Central Station was Mich uh, Detroit's version of Grand Central Station. It had been dilapidated for years. In fact, you could see it in the Batman v Superman um, movie where Batman and Superman are fighting in this ruined building. Guess what that ruined building was? The Michigan Central Station. And now Ford purchased it and completely renovated it, brought it back to its former glory, 
dumped tons and tons of millions of dollars into it. <laughs> yeah, rich benefactors. That's what architecture and needs, right? <laughs> it, well, yes, <laughs> but loaded benefactors. And, and so the but we see so many other buildings of equal or more historic prominence being demolished all the time. Yeah. In fact, the Wainwright Building could very well be, um, depending on the outcome of the uh, the auction and everything, it, it, I've read articles where it can actually be demolished by the new owner. Mm -hmm. um, and not saying that it should be or anything like that. Obviously, if I bought it, I would save it. I have no money for it, so I'm... <laughs> Um, but you know, I'm just, I'm now, I guess on this like journey of trying to figure out what is making, why architecture is so important, what makes buildings lovable and what makes certain buildings savable when other buildings are disposable. Sure. Yeah. It's like the popular That's kids, a... right? They get all the yeah. attention. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And that's it. Oh, we, we've 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 traversed much ground yeah. in this episode. Uh, thank you for kicking off the conversation with uh, with your weird OCD. <laughs> You're welcome.